Okay, we are going with the show here. Howdy, gang. And there's our exciting little clickety clacks and so forth and so on, which apparently people cannot hear, but I can hear them here. And our opening logo for Troubles in Paradise, the Methodology of Creationism Project, obliterating creationism one source at a time and enjoying it all along the way. Howdy, everybody. This is uh, the Today's Evolution Hour. Uh, we'll have shortly. Uh, hello, Brian Stevens in the live chat. Hi, Brian. And uh, oh, uh, Jackson Wheat stepped out for a bit. He'll be back in uh, shortly. Uh, and we'll probably have some little catch up to do on the uh, uh, Rocks uh, Were There book that we're doing to obliterate answers in Genesis. But in the meantime, I'm continuing to obliterate um, the um, Contested Bones book. Uh, by Rupi and Sanford, where they're going into all of the evidence for human evolution and showing that, oh dear, it is all wrong. Yeah, not quite. Uh, I was sent the book, as you all know, uh, by um, a, a critic of creationism that didn't have the time to be dealing with it himself, so I went ahead. And um, he said he would send it to me, and I, I'm pr proceeding it, making good the uh, issue. Uh, it's a useful enterprise because uh, it's adding to the measurements. Remember, in my tip project, I'm measuring everybody uh, in the anti-evolution movement that, sci uh, that cites primary sources. And this is a measurement, therefore, of how much of the science field they're actually paying attention to. Uh, they've uh, worked their way to Homo naledi, which was the one that were found in the cave uh, where there were apparently intentional burials. It didn't seem to be constructed from animals just kind of falling into places. And so there's still a lot of discussion on that. And also they were a relatively small brain compared to uh, say Homo erectus. Uh, the dating is still uncertain because uh, of, of they're having to figure out exactly when it was. Oh, uh, what do we got a question in here? Uh, oh, hey, why aren't I blue? <laughs> oh, you mean that uh, uh, Terry Davis, do you want a, a wrench? Uh, let's see, let's, uh, let's see if I can make you a moderator here. Let me hold on a minute. Come on, come on, come on. There we go. You should have a wrench now. There we go. Use it wisely. Um, and one of the things that, that I hope to be demonstrating on, a, on this whole exercise is the utility of source methods. Uh, footnotes and source base are often seen as kind of the dull things at the bottom of the page or the back of the book. But from a source methods approach, oh, no, that's the meat of it that you can make your argument find it handy, but where are you getting your information from and how reliable is your information? And are you paying attention to all the relevant information? Are you fairly representing the sources you cite? Anybody that starts screwing up on those, um, you're in trouble uh, because you're building arguments based on falsehood. You're, you're bearing false witness um, if you're looking at it from a religious frame. And so every example of where they're suppressing information gets really suspicious. And we're getting that in the uh, brain department. Homo naledi's brains are not quite like humans. And uh, the uh, argument that uh, Rupi and Samford are making is a, a logical one from their position. There are humans and there are not human apes. And there's nothing in between. Well, the problem is these ones from Homo erectus and Australopithecines and all the rest are the in-between. And they can't allow that. So they've got to be very careful about how they categorize stuff. And this pops up in the sources they cite to where um, uh, things are transitional or uh, the incipient features, the first wrinklings of things in brain uh, uh, biology and the like are, um, are showing up in these animals. And they're become progressively more like us, which is why Homo naledi is placed in the Homo genus and not in Australopithecines. Um, the attempt that uh, Rupi did to suggest that uh, the brains of Homo uh, uh, Naledi are just perfectly normal humans uh, screws up with the sources. Uh, Holloway's big paper that came out uh, only in 2018, they couldn't have known about, and I put a link up to that. But uh, some of the material that they were citing secondarily, uh, there were some uh, pieces from Stringer and others that were clearly not making the argument that uh, Rupi and Sanford wanted them to. Um, Rupi, um, oh, let me see if I can find the little spot here that struck me as particularly revealing of where um, uh, they were claiming no such thing. Um, 
he had um uh, let's see here it was a stringer 21 there we go um on page uh, 184, uh, Rupi and Samford were writing that um, though there was quite a bit of guesswork and possible bias in the reconstruction process due to these uncertainties, the adult cranial capacity of Naledi was estimated to range from 466 cubic centimeters to, and 560 cubic centimeters and cited source 21, Stringer, Human Evolution, Many Mysteries of Homo Naledi E-Life. Well, that was just a commentary article, but I put the link up to it. It was relating to the Berger papers. Uh, the problem was, is there was absolutely nothing in that. And if you could spot any, please let me know. I, I didn't see any indication that uh, Stringer was claiming that there was any um, guesswork and possible bias in the reconstruction. Uh, in fact, there were areas of debate, but it wasn't about the brain. It was about other areas, about the uh, nature of the cave. Wh was it a deliberate burial or not? And particularly when it was dated, which they were still uncertain about back when that was coming out in, in uh, uh, 2015. So when you've got a matter of um, uh, sources that are not saying what the person says they are, you're in trouble. And uh, um, I would have loved to have cited some of the other uh, um, technical papers, but they're slow to get to that. And I put the point about Holloway. Um, in our, um, uh, oh, Elisa for Truth says, yeah, uh, she's heard that they adjusted the time when H. Naledi lived. Any thoughts? Yeah, I've, I've still got to check in on what the current material is on it. There was a big divide um, as to how far back, whether it was like a couple of million years or, or, or more recently. And I can't quite recall. Jackson here. Uh, I can't quite recall right off the bat whether or not they've actually pulled the date down more recently or not. They found, um, I think... I've heard something that, that at the very least the temporal range is much broader. In other words, that that, that um, they may have involved a much longer period of time. But I, I'll, I'll have to look up the technical material on that. I, I have to beg off as uh, I haven't gotten into that section yet. Can you recall, Jackson, whether or not they'd finally uh, changed the overall dating for Homo Naledi or not? For Naledi? Yeah. Uh, I haven't looked at it in a long time. Last when yeah, I looked yeah, at it, they I'll, were... I'll keep that in, in mind on that. So uh, uh, this will indicate to you that I, I try not to think off the cuff when I can't recall what a particular detail is. And uh, uh, I, I, in a way, I'm going through um, the Rupi and Sanford argument in the order they do it. And so only after I get farther down on the road to where I find out what they might have left out, uh, just as they left out the creationist version of Australopithecus sediba, uh, in the uh, the Sediba sections. Um, but the neat thing about it uh, relates to how its brain is starting to get more of what we're used to. Um, there's more issues about whether or not there's more of a, of a language processing system in Broadman's area that includes Brokaw's area. We know Brokaw's area is showing up in Homo habilis earlier. So um, that's not a shock. And it's very revealing that that Rupi and Sanford implied, they, they, they did an authority quote, which was a kind of an inept one because the section that they nicked it from, uh, even their own version, didn't exactly say what they wanted to. Um, let's, um, let's see. It was, um, uh, as the new scientist states, Dean Falk at Florida State, or, or maybe it's Deanne, uh, uh, she's a, a female scientist. Dean mm -hmm. Volk at uh, Florida State University in Tallahassee is especially excited by the fact that Berger's team has produced a cast of Homo Naledi's small brain. Images of it hint at interesting features close to one brain region associated with speech in modern humans, she says. Berger says it's possible that for the first time we have found another creature not that closely related to us, yet with a cognitive ability different but essentially equal to ours. Um, that's not helping their argument any. Uh, and uh, of simply citing Berger on this point, because Berger is definitely viewing it as a transitional form and possibly close to the root of uh, the human um, uh, genus uh, tracing back into Homo. Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, this was taken from a 2015 New Scientist piece, which turned out not to be available online when I did checking, but a 2017 one was. And by the same author at New Scientist, and it had further quotes uh, from um, uh, Deanne Falk, and uh, she was indicating that she was very skeptical, skeptical blah, 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 about whether or not the Broadman's area uh, was all that human, that it looked a bit more ape-like to her in terms of these endocasts and locations of the material. 
And so even at that stage in this secondary material, we can see that we're talking a transitional form here. We're not talking something that's just obviously human. And literally nobody in the paleoanthropology field tries to classify humans uh, or um, Homo naledi as Homo sapiens. You still had a big squabble for a while over Homo uh, uh, floresiensis that was argued that it was just a, a microcephalic human being or something, but that's all kind, kind of gone by the wayside. And I think the argument there is that it is a, a, um, a remnant population of Homo erectus with a bit of a small brain. Uh, so you always have to let the dust settle here, but the, but the cherry pickers who don't want to let the data just run as it is, and then you figure out what the facts are and then move on. Um, the creationist has a preordained mm. structure that they have to fit everything into. And uh, that gets into terrible uh, uh, problems when it comes to any of the actual taxa and any of the data field. So I hope Aren't you'll be you, reading- Are you asking about the date of it? Yeah, yeah. The date seems to be uh, 300,000 years ago. Oh, okay, that pulls down quite a ways because they had originally thought they were back uh, a couple of million years. And so there was, uh, there was some deliberate issues about uh, and Stringer was bringing this up in his commentary on the thing, is that they hadn't settled the dating. Uh, um, uh, having it down that level, 300,000 now, that's coming into a population that is in the time just as humans are starting to appear down in Africa. So uh, you've got an interesting little coalescence going on in there. The, the, whole Af the whole population mix of humans and our cousins in Homo uh, have been busy. Oh, Elisa, bring where do, do the Denisovans fit in? Ah, in fact, that Stringer piece brings up uh, the Denisovans, uh, as I recall, and uh, there there's not a huge amount of uh, fossil data on them. I think they found a slightly more complete example. I think of a skull or something, but for a while it was just a, a fragmentary teeth, and that yeah. and, and they're far from having a full bit. But they're so recent that they're able to get DNA from it. So even though they don't have the full bodies, they've got stuff, and and it looks like. They're one of these odd, not quite Neanderthals, not quite humans that are operating around in the hinterlands there in Eurasia that are um, uh, stirring up trouble as to try to figure out how many populations of hominids there are knocking around in our immediate family tree. We know there's been some interbreeding. Uh, there's even, I think, if memory serves me, there's some ghost indication that there's another lineage still yes. that has contributed a bit in to Polynesia. the human genome. Yeah, or the Melanesians. So, um, Sorry, yeah, the Melanesians. It, it would be sweet if we just had fossils of everybody that ever lived and had a complete DNA list for every single one of them. But unfortunately, we can't do that. So you've got to, to piece everything together, layer by layer by layer, on that. Um, um, with, when you mention the uh, the coalescence of different primates, when you get to the, the Minton section on vestigial, uh, on because he does his part about vestigial traits and whatnot. And, you know, they're not vestigial, even though by his definition they are vestigial, but that's beside the point. Uh, he talks about wisdom teeth, and there's a whole long section, I'm sure you'll add to it, about how our jaw became smaller because there was a dietary shift, there was the advent of tools and fire and all this other stuff that was going on. There were genetic things going on. And so I was reading a bunch of papers on the shift in grasses in Africa around the plioplasticine mm. divide and so there was C3 like three and c4s and stuff yeah there was like paranthropus there were australopithecines there were homo all operating at the same time so <laughs> yeah this is the, the thing that when uh, you're in a time when you probably haven't recalled a time when the single species model was the standard, although you may bump into it peripherally. But it was a big deal, the, the idea that there was just a, a nice, neat parade from one group to the next, and, and there was never more than one species at a time. This was the, the dominant viewpoint among paleoanthropology back in the 50s and 60s. And, and uh, uh, Johansson and Tattersall and others started shaking the limbs on that one, Tattersall in particular, and, and everything has moved uh, Johansson in that uh, uh, in a completely different direction. And now it's a matter that, that um, uh, where you would go, wow, it's amazing that they hadn't seen that before. So the idea that there would be still more examples of subpopulations, uh, if th there was a big debate, I went into it in Planet of the Apes. Another reason to read my stuff on my website 
uh, Planet of the Apes went into a lot of the history of the single species model versus and and the out of Africa model versus um, uh, the uh, multi-regional one. Walpoff, who's a big burly guy who could pass for a Neanderthal on a, on a, a is very burly in the, the brow ridges and the whole thing. He's very uh, a wrestler type. Um, but he uh, and remains he's still active in the field and in a way the the old debate about was homo erectus spreading out as a single population blob from which humans emerged from the african branch or were there little subpopulations that were generating very great diversity that were not quite separate species and interbred a lot and all of this stuff that was the multi-regional model that walpar favored well it looks like both of them were right uh, and both of them were wrong, uh, that you had fairly discrete population blobs moving around, and there was a lot of gene flow back and forth, and we're starting to get the actual fossils to blip in quite a lot of that stuff. Still, a lot of it pops up as just teeth, because remember, teeth are extremely durable. The rest of you isn't. And unless you're deliberately burying, uh, you're dead. Uh, the odds are that you're just going to have bits and pieces of you survive, and the teeth are the easiest. So mammals in general are known often by their teeth, whole groups of them. It's only because mammal teeth are so bloody specialized that it's possible to be very, very specific about what things are, where you go, oh, here's a tooth. If it's the right kind of tooth, not a molar, but maybe an incisor, uh, you can tell things about what species it's from because they are so distinctive. But uh, uh, that's that's an entirely separate little story uh, to go RJ, into. Are can't you determine an entire animal's body from its tooth alone? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, uh, Cuvier and uh, and Owen uh, thought they could, and in some ways, uh, you can. What was fascinating were the ones that uh, I think I made a joke about uh, uh, um, uh, Krieger, who was complaining in his in his first version of the reptile mammal transition that uh, this particular one was only known by a skull, and therefore, where did they come up with the body? And then later on, he describes it as like mouse-like in the second version that he did. Well, apparently it grew a body after all, uh, because he wanted to pigeonhole it as the little mouse type. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's just such a fool. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it would be nice if we could say that, that foolishness was rare in anti-evolutionism. Unfortunately, it's... The other way around, um, that, that it's um, hard to yeah. find a non-foolish anti-evolutionist. I'm one paragraph into the chapter I'm working on, which is about Elizabeth Mitchell right now, and I've, I had to write like a page and a half just, on, just separating all the insanity that was on and tracing the claims back to their source yeah. and all this stuff. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, there's, oh, there's a the lot of... of there's a lot of troping going on and a, a lot of mushing arguments together. And sometimes, yeah, you reach a stage where you'll see a paragraph and you've got this huge amount of mistakes, compressed, distilled mistakes that you have to deconstruct to tell them, here's where they're going astray. And then they're going astray in the next sentence. And the next sentence just goes even farther. Well, that's like the uh, Arn Ra always says that. Uh... Kent Hoven has a line where it has more lies in it than there are words in the sentence. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh hi, hi, Brooke. She, uh, she's in the uh, live chat there. Hey, Brooke. Um, the, uh, the, the thing about uh, uh, Lisa says, kind of like they say, how did they reconstruct Lucy from a knee? Uh, uh, some things are more diagnostic than others. And yeah. that's why if you're looking for things in relation to how a diet was dealt with, you need to have things relating to the jaw. If you want to talk about bipedality and walking around, you need to see, well, you'd like to see knees, you'd like to see pelvises, you'd like to see feet, uh, you'd like to see all of that stuff. The arm may or may not tell you anything at all about whether or not it can walk bipedal, although it can tell you whether it will brachiate and, and uh, hanging of things the way orangutans and others do. And so limb proportions bears on it. There, there's ru muscle robustness. All of these things uh, go along. But if you have a, a fossil that say only 40% complete. But when you look at the pieces, you can see that it's got a bunch of stuff from one side of the limb, but nothing from the other. Well, their animals are by, by are symmetrical. So you immediately know what would have been on the other side. And so often, even though it may be only 40% in terms of the bones, it's actually like 80% in terms of what you can tell about the whole animal, depending on which piece there is. Obviously a pelvic bone, if you have the whole pelvis, it's the whole bone. But anything that's on the left side of the body is going to be mirrored on the right side. Uh, so you can tell an awful lot that way.
um, and details about rib structure. Uh, um, we can tell you about uh, the lung structure. That's one of, one of the reasons there's been just a big revolution. There was a really neat series of shows. I think it was shown on PBS just a couple months ago. Uh, about Neanderthals and Andy Circus was involved in it because they did live cap reconstructions of of they would digitally put onto the actors performing as the things in terms of how they moved they would figure out what kind of weight differential they figured out that that uh, Neanderthals were likely uh, really good short sprinters uh, but would have gotten winded fairly easily. And so they were a bit, a bit might, like me on the 50 yard dash. <laughs> that would have been great for slow starts, quickies, but not necessarily for a long stamina a bit. I'm pretty um, sure, RJ, the only thing you can tell about a fossil is that it died. Yes, yes. To quote the, 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 the noted non paleontologist Kent Hoven. I know. It says, what is it? They call him Captain Hoven now. Is what I've heard people <laughs> calling him recently, because I mean that name bears about as much weight as yeah. He, well, he he uh, he may actually be able to captain a boat. He certainly can't read technical papers, uh, so he's way off on the on the mark on that one. But it's been uh, an intriguing uh, uh, educational thing for me, reminding me of all the various uh, technical work that's been done and how complicated it is. Uh, in working out these various uh, uh, things. Oh, uh, Lisa, for truth is, uh, do you think that if Neanderthals had been more spread out, they would still be around? Actually, they were spread out. Uh, they may have been a little too spread out. They they had a long run. Remember, uh, we've been here maybe 300,000 years. The latest data is pushing it back that far. But the Neanderthals have been around for 600,000. They were they 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 went they weathered climate changes and all sorts of things. And so it's still an amazing thing is to talk about whether or not they uh, were not quite able to adapt to just one more limitation uh, in their uh, um, um, diet or their range. They had a, a, there's a good argument to be made that they didn't trade as widely. They did trade uh, for things, uh, but they didn't have quite as large a network because they can tell from the, the detritus sites in a Neanderthal thing versus uh, Homo erectus uh, or uh, humans. Uh, eventually, that um, uh, how, how far afield they were getting material for spear points and other kinds of things. Uh, and uh, uh, the, we'd love to know more about what was going on in the Neanderthal's head. Um, how uh, good were they at conveying uh, abstract ideas? Uh, did they have full language or partial language compared to what we have? Uh, we don't know. Um, from the DNA, we can tell they would have had a lot of the genes for it. Uh, and bit by bit, they'll probably paleogenomics people will be ferreting through to find out more and more about genetically reconstructing them. Uh, I they probably, vocal range, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's another factor is their vocal structure. They, I think there were some vowels they probably couldn't pronounce. So there would have been a little bit different range there. It's amazing the amount of work that's been done over the years on these things. And so that also knocks in a cocked hat. Uh, the arguments that are still fielded in Rupi and Sanford that Neanderthals were just people, slightly unusual people. Uh, no, uh, they were a separate species all on their own and they were capable of boinking with us and interbreeding uh, not an enormous number of times uh, when they came together. Uh, but yeah, they had a huge range all through uh, Europe and into Eurasia. Um, uh, in modern day Iran and Iraq and the Anatolia, these are all places where uh, some of the major uh, Neanderthal finds are done. And they also interacted in what would be the Holy Lands uh, quite a long ways later, uh, where um, the new breeds of human populations were bumping into the southern range of the Neanderthal and um, uh, producing some interbreedings and in that in there. And also in, um, I think that a cave in Spain uh, is an indication to wear to or something like that uh, is one of the other of your reading. And this was really a shocking development uh, when the fines were first uh, coming in, in in 10, 15 years ago. But now we're sort of going, well, duh, uh, does this surprise us at all? I never thought I would live to a point where we would actually have Neanderthal DNA, full DNA to look at. So that, that shows you how the technology has gone and the number of samples have advanced. Um, uh, it'd be wonderful if we could get some of these other groupings 
going on. The problem with a lot of stuff in, in, in particularly in equatorial Africa is the climate was often the sort that was just terrible for preserving stuff. It's the reason That's why, why we have, have such have terrible chimp yeah, chimpanzees are just awful because they so live in a what? place where the bodies disintegrate. So yeah. you, you don't get many fossils. Yeah, a single one that was found back in 2005. That's all we got. Yeah. <laughs> And that, that's the one when anybody starts talking about, well, why don't we have all the fossils for the chimpanzees? Well, where do you propose to look? That's another Bermuda Triangle defense problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah we're going to have some fun stuff uh, on the, uh, the layer bit. But before we get to my uh, shameless plug in the middle of the show, let's uh, give some recaps of what we've been doing on the uh, the rocks are, are um, uh, there uh, in your end, because you've been uh, dumping some additional chapters on me, you busy little beaver, in spite of your appendectomy. Uh, uh. <laughs> you know what? I actually feel I folded that into the the chapter because it was very topical. So yeah, yeah, you can uh, say you know firsthand experience because I've never had one of those. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, I had actually, I think it was the week before, or maybe two weeks before, something like that. I was reading up on the history of appendectomies because Minton and other creationists make this wild claim that Darwin said the appendix is useless, not just vestigial, but useless because Darwin did differentiate in uh, Descent of Man. I know because I had to pull out my copy and go check through it. Um, he does differentiate. He says, so Darwin says it's useless, even though Darwin was kind of copying from someone else. And so Minton says, well, how many people throughout history just took Darwin's word for it and got it removed? Yeah, how many? Can you Probably name Probably not many. As far as I can recall, uh, nobody said, hey, I have this useless appendix. I'm going to have an operation. No, when one has an appendicitis, one has yeah. an operation. <laughs> um, I, so I found lots of papers because, shockingly enough, there's a lot of history on appendectomies. Who would have Gee, guessed? It's almost like the doctors were worried about lawsuits. Right. Um, and it turns out, <laughs> this is the funny part, I think. The truth is actually the exact opposite of what Minton said. Surprise. Ooh. Who would have oh, guessed? yeah, you're going to be citing the the work on that the uh, uh, what, what American Medical Journal or what was that from? Um, I found we might be thinking of different ones. You might have a, uh, another one to fold in, but mm -hmm. um, but I was looking through some papers that were saying actually when people got appendicitis, doctors feared doing surgery on them for all the complications because it was not as good technology and all this stuff, and. Yeah. And so they would actually just prescribe antibiotics. And actually that worked pretty well, especially in like the Navy when you're on a ship for a long time and you can't just have an operation on the boat. And so if you developed appendicitis, the doctor would just prescribe you antibiotics and that actually worked yeah, pretty pill. well. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, so it, it, it's fascinating. These little tropes that, that get lodged in the creationist brain and it sounds like something they want to be true, and it never occurs to them to check out whether it actually is true. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, he, he cites no source for it. He says it like two or three times throughout the course of the chapter, never cites a source for it. He does cite. Yeah. And I think he, he is a medical doctor, Manton, so he should have known better. Oh, uh, maybe. Uh, is he? I thought, I thought he was actually a medical doctor. I didn't know. Uh, uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong on on his discipline. I haven't been a, a too much of a medical uh, groupie. Uh, regardless, he whatever it was, he he just did not decide to check anything, and so um, and so it was very funny, you know, going through all that because eventually he cites an Alfred Romer textbook on the, or titled "The Vertebrate Body," which was revamped a couple of times, yeah. and. And uh, Romer makes a joke. He's talking about the vermiform appendix, and he says, "He says uh, what is he, he says something like the appendix is called by some evolutionists as a vestigial organ, proving something or other about evolution. But the real what is, he says something like the real function of the appendix is to provide uh, payment to doctors or something like that. <laughs> and he uh, was he was treating that as as more of a." Uh... Uh, yeah, uh, the thing that struck me most about Menton was the scholarly aspect, because a huge block of Menton, he's still doing actual writing currently, but a big blob of the stuff that's available from Menton online uh, is actually stuff that he did in the 80s and 90s in this, uh, oh, uh, uh, some St. Louis dispatch or something like that. They were just newspaper article, editorial kinds of things. 
uh, short squibs. And, and that still gets trotted out by Answers in Genesis. And, and you have to look up, oh, a, a 2012 posting from it. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, first done in 1995. Okay. You're <laughs> right, RJ. That, hmm? He holds a PhD in biology from Brown University and served as a professor at Washington University's School of Medicine in St. Louis. Okay. So, yeah. yeah he, so he, he should have had a... Um, uh, a better familiarity with that rather than jumping off the gangplank. But then again, creationists have this tendency to jump off the gangplank uh, in their I, own way. Well, let me pause think, briefly here yeah. for my shameless plug. And let me get in here and, sh and thank us. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, and go through the little share bit. Ta-da. And then the, there we go, and the infinite regress. There we go. There's our patrons. And at last, it's reached the point where I now hit the 1st of February to where I can be guaranteed now that actually the money that you dear people have contributed to the uh, Patreon project actually is getting to me. And that's making a big difference in how I can snuck along one month at a time. So colleagues, Andrew and Hendrel and Eric and researchers, Keith and Fino and Brad and Ralph and Meet, Convert Me and Pologia. Pologia, hi, Pologia and Sewer, and assistant researchers, Direwolf and Doronku and James and Not Available, Not Available, or Nana, uh, Staggles and Surus, who's helping me with the audio book. I still got to get more on that uh, uh, to him uh, for uh, Paralogs of Phileas Fogg, and Todas Real, and Friends of Eat Meal, who has read Phileas Fogg, uh, Steve Bauman and Marigail, and uh, Daniel and Bo from far off Europe, and Alex and Paul and Zeshi and some legacy patrons who helped early on in the game. And so some of your money will eventually have filtered through me once I got the spigot going. Uh, Jan and John and Mona and Sun and Everett. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you and everybody else who can join in to help as a patron, whether it's five bucks or one buck or 10 bucks or whatever on a regular basis this will be just very important because it's something I can count on knowing in the same way that I know about social security and other works that I do. Whereas book royalties and all the other things are like, uh, maybe some, you know, no, depends like a roller coaster. So uh, there is the um, uh, shameless plug. Uh, oops, I suppose I, uh, I forgot to put the other half of the shameless plug, which is alert about the websites. Well, I got, I got both of the, um, the GoFundMe and the, um, um, uh, Patreon uh, link uh, is in the description to the video, so uh, you can latch on to it from there. And um, uh, if you don't, and you can find it at my website, uh, I put the links up on that as well. So there's plenty of ways to click and and flow the money and stuff around on that. Um, I've I've made it all a lot of progress, I think, from going from totally invisible to largely invisible uh, in the course of the last few years. Uh, there's still a long ways to go on things. Um, I'd love to be uh, doing more um, lecturing. I, um, when we get the second book out of the way, we'll have to deal with that. I'd love to eventually get a regular publisher for uh, both of our stuff uh, with illustrations and all of that. But all of that's eh, down the line. We'll see. We'll see. At any rate, uh, I think Jackson and I can agree that we're doing the best work we can. We're being fair to the data. We're fascinated by the subjects that we're looking at. We're gobsmacked by the head up the ass stupidity of so many of people with PhDs who sh should have known better. And um, it's there's a, there's a certain entertaining exhilaration you get when you see somebody with their head up their ass. And as you extract it to find out what they were looking at, <laughs> you, you learn a lot of fascinating material that way. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, it's a very delicate extraction procedure. Yeah, yeah. And and source methods is uh, an unforgiving taskmaster on this. Everybody has to play it. Uh, I do and you do and everybody else on it. But when you learn the skills, it makes you a better researcher. It makes you careful. You, you don't shoot from the hip. You never accuse anybody of things they haven't said. You try to document things carefully. And and we've all known in when tracking down stuff, um, uh, I, I was talking before the show, and I'll give a little brief relay of it, of things I've just adjusted and added into um, uh, the radiometric dating chapter. It, it happened to be that I stumbled upon some uh, several of the creationists, uh, including ones relating to these radiometric dating things. They have these like quote minds of things and they'll latch onto the same technical paper over and over and over again, often 
with this exactly the same right they'll, they'll copy everything out just exactly correct without the name and title it's just the volume number and that because they got it from quote mine well one of the ones that's been quote mine for years that i just took at face value because i could never find it online and there's a reason why <laughs> And that's um, uh, from uh, Robert Lee and from the Anthropological Journal of Canada. Doesn't that sound impressive? Indeed. And you could never find it online. I couldn't find any information on this Anthropological Journal of Canada. So I thought maybe it was only being published for a while because the article was in 1981. Uh, it the article itself was later reprinted, as I found out, at the Creation Research Society Quarterly. And Andrew Snelling riffed off of that version. But the journal itself, what was that? Well, by weird coincidence, my own university of at Eastern Washington University happened to have carried that little piece. And when I went into the stacks and looked at it in a very small little section, it was a mimeograph pamphlet that had been put out by a bunch of Canadian creationists for a couple years. <laughs> it wasn't a journal. It wasn't a normal science thing. Uh, the, it sounded fancy, the Anthropological Journal of Canada. Nope. And uh, uh, so when I found that out, that they were mainly concerned about uh, proving that the Norse discovered America. That was their big bugbear. They just couldn't stand all these ones talking about that. Columbus! Uh, but along the way, they were also creationists and they were complaining about radiometric dating. But uh, and a lot, and the article he wrote had oodles of footnotes and references and all that. But still, the, the, these, this was not a scientist and this was not a, a, a normal journal um, anymore. Yeah. I could suddenly set up uh, the, uh, the Anthropological Journal of Spokane and uh, have it on my photocopier. Yeah. No, that's well, not that. <laughs> that's like that guy who had the pamphlet that we read uh he was all about abiogenesis mm, oh, and yeah, he yeah. actually wrote he, so he was just a like a pastor or preacher or whatever he wrote with a guy who had a degree in physics like a technical paper in quotes with references and all this and they tried sending it into different journals of course it got rejected by everyone because it was garbage the darwinian but, prejudice against crap right yeah and so that kind mm. of reminds me of that. Yeah, well, the other uh, bits, now that we're in the second half hour, I put uh, um, some fascinating stuff. Uh, for those who have uh, been following, once in a while I will mention old earth creationists. They're a, a dying breed uh, in the maw between intelligent design and young earth creationism. Uh, but uh, you, Ross, uh, who I had a chat with on Skype once, he never put it up on his show, though. So apparently I, he didn't get the kinds of material that he could use for apologetic purposes. But he he tends to have an awful lot of glee clubby kind of stuff. And this was linked to when he had a tweet. This was back on um, uh, January 7th. Wouldn't it be marvelous if volcanic eruptions were frequent when nobody lived near them and infrequent when people were exploiting their rich soils for agriculture? A recent paper gives evidence this design feature. See my latest blog for details. Yeah, oh that piqued my curiosity. So I looked up the, the blog, how cyclical volcanic activity benefits humanity. And it turns out that he was hyping this kind of far because he doesn't really make that claim in the article. The closest he gets to it is down at the bottom. Uh, these especially intense and simultaneous fertilization events give us more reasons to thank God for his supernatural blessings poured out on humanity. They also demonstrate that God planned in advance that billions of us would experience sufficiently high technology civilization that makes possible the rapid spread of his message of redemption from human sin. Holy moly, what a conclusion jump. I mean, for one thing, if you think about where cultures live and where volcanoes are, uh, obviously, uh, he, he cited one technical paper, only one. Uh, I, I couldn't, I didn't put a link up to it, but you'll find it in, in Ross's thing uh, because it's not available open access, but I was able to get the full PDF of it from other ways. But anyway, it was a, a paper from brand new 2019, Milankovitch frequencies in Tephra records of volcanic arcs, the relation of kilo year scale cyclic variations in volcanism to global climate change. I'll see that up there, perfectly nice little paper. Uh, this is talking about over hundreds of thousands of years. It's the cyclical, the idea that the wobbling of the Earth's axis because of the Milankovitch cycles is producing little bits of stresses that tend to produce cyclical pulses in volcanic eruptions. 
Now, the problem is, is that, first of all, this would have no bearing on where people were living. People have a tendency to live where they can grow things once they became agricultural. And were they not so they would want to live in places other than deserts, and they would want to live in places other than where your crops won't grow because it's too cold. And so that restricts a lot of the things. They often live on rivers, including ones that flood. Flood plains and river estuaries are not usually connected to volcanic arcs. They can be, but not a huge amount. The biggest valley rivers are, are ones that are kind of old rivers that are cycling down through a big plain. And those don't have volcanoes typically in them. You can have a certain degree of volcanism. And when you find at plate boundaries um, that uh, the earliest civilizations weren't starting up in Italy, for example, which has quite a lot of active volcanoes. Uh, Mexico and other places uh, have uh, a lot of active volcanoes. Um, and uh, But a lot of areas just don't. And so the idea that he would have to kind of think through the fiddly bit details, um, the other factor has to do with the fact that volcanoes tend not to erupt constantly. So you get remarkably rich areas. The people who lived in Pompeii had never experienced a, a, a major volcanic eruption. It was just a wonderful place to live. Uh, the, the mountain rumbled once in a while, but that's the Vulcan god down below. And, 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 and it literally didn't occur to them that volcanoes existed, that the idea that there were big magma chambers that would go spurt like pimples, uh, that that was not something that they had any direct experience of. And, and it, it, it took an awful long time for that to worry uh, it through. But in the case of Pompeii, uh, they stuck around way too much and uh, got pyroclasted to death uh, in, in one fell swoop. And then people went back and lived there. And so you've got millions of people living around Naples uh, still on the volcano, which erupts occasionally to the point where they ought to realize there's a problem. Same thing with Etna uh, over in Sicily. Uh, and, and all of that's from plate tectonics. So you're more likely to be seeing things that are subduction plates or um, uh, collision plates. Uh, Italy is on the plate that the African plate, technically, that's slamming into Asia. Um, the volcanoes in Japan are produced from a subduction thing. Our volcanoes on the Cascades are produced from subduction things with these uh, mantle plumes that will then rise like hot air balloons and produce these, I call them pimple volcanoes, because um, whereas um, your your some volcanic arcs have an awful lot of volcanoes, uh, Indonesia is just chock-a-block with them, uh, our volcanoes tend to stand out like a sore thumb in the landscape. And Rainier and these others are are kind of in, isolated in a crinkly environment. And then, of course, you've got the big mother, uh, the Yellowstone superplume. Uh, so this this idea that, that Ross wants to ramrod things so that everything is providential. And the problem is he's got that chronology to work with. So he has to explain, but he doesn't really do that, why God spent all the time on dinosaurs. I mean, he had mammals, he had everything all ready to go. Why not get things going? And is there evolution? Does he have to go through primate stage? Uh, do we really have to have uh, C4 gla grasses before we can have human civilization? Uh, do we really have to do uh, things? Uh, it's, a, it's a Dr. Pangloss view of the world. And I thought this one was a particularly weird version of that. Uh, did you want to uh, pop in on uh, your reaction to Providential volcanoes. Uh. <laughs> I just think that's a little strange. It's a little curious, uh, but oh well. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's it's very much in a Rossian way because if you have a providential god, everything must be there for a reason. So if there have been ice ages, there must be a reason for them. If there are volcanoes, there must be a reason for them. If there are asteroid impacts and mass extinctions, there must have been a reason for them. And so they, it comes up with these elaborate ad hoc explanations for why the things that took place over millions and billions of years long before there were human beings in some cases were all part of the grand plan that leads to Jesus Christ and the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but it's just a matter that uh, if you want to think about the fact that <coughs> if life occurs on various planets, if they require <coughs> certain elements <coughs> in their metabolism, those elements had to have existed first. <coughs> if you're going to have civilization that makes use of iron, 
could any uh, civilization develop on a planet that didn't develop cyanobacteria that rusted the oceans uh, and produced these huge iron deposits? On the other hand, um, could any multicellular organism have developed if it didn't have cyanobacteria around? Do you need oxygen? Well, all of this um, suggests that why isn't God's purpose to produce nematodes? or uh kind of rinks or something else why are we the beetles. pinnacle of things yeah beetles you know you've got five hundred thousand species of beetles you know uh I've, I've, and even more the little plus the little nematodes plus they live in a lot of weird little places so this is the that tendency to think teleologically purposefully when there isn't any and given the fact that the the biblical account is so not fitting that uh, argument. It's it's a flat earth geocentric worldview. They're not thinking in terms of mass extinctions. They're not thinking in terms of any of that. Or God didn't, if all those 300,000 years that God was knocking around with human beings and never once said, hey, there's iron under your feet. Here, figure this out. Here, I'll tell you how to do it. Uh, no, he doesn't help any. Human beings have to work all of this stuff out of itself. So that was one of the things that struck me. This uh, that uh, and I'm uh, when I encounter these weird things in my course of research, I'll put I put them into the future things. Now, one that popped up just today, that is kind of creepy, but it did strike me as telling a lot about the way people think about things. Had to do with a debate in, in Twitter about uh, Jeffrey Dahmer and what how many serial killers tend to be religious, or what motivates them, or are, are any typically atheists. And so they were having this fist fight back and forth. Well, I haven't really recalled too much about Jeffrey Dahmer other than <laughs> my uh, uh, my niece's um, a religious husband told me uh, a, a, a terrible joke. And that tells you some idea about, about their framework where he says that the, the Jeffrey Dahmer song, My Baloney Has a First Name, and it's... <laughs> which is really quite macabre. Uh, anyway... Um, that uh, I hadn't recognized a little detail. First off, that, that Dahmer apparently converted to creationism when he was in jail. And then when I started looking up a little bit more about that as the conversation was going back and forth, uh, he was reading creationist material. Kent Hovind got in the game because he apparently helped convert him to that. But the interesting thing turned out that, that Dahmer's dad was apparently a creationist and apparently not a creationist because of his son. Uh, that he was listed in Answers in Genesis as a creationist, a chemist, and uh, and the fact that he was a chemist, that's another indication it's kind of a field that's not unusual to find that in creationism, uh, as opposed to biochemistry or development of biology or, or zoology. Um, and that um, it was Daddy Leonard Dahmer who was suggesting that his son read these various Institute for Creation Research books. So this was an interesting little tidbit about the role of what kind of background mindset was occurring in this rather dysfunctional family, but apparently with a creationist dad, that spawned one of the weirder uh, serial killers of the 1980s and 90s who slipped through the cracks over and over and over again. Uh, in fact, there was a, a, a chilling episode that was on one of the, uh, I don't think it was a TED Talk, but it was on the um, uh, Moth Radio Hour, I think. Uh, where a guy was talking about that he had almost been picked up by Dahmer in Minnesota uh, at a bar, but apparently he wasn't Dahmer's type. So the fact that he was um, uh, missed this opportunity for a hookup probably saved his life. <laughs> and, uh, and he left the punchline at the end, the fact that this was Jeffrey Dahmer, the person that uh, he finally recognized him when he saw him in the papers. Oh, oh that was the guy that was the bar trolling um, there in Minnesota. So um, uh, that connects up this creepy little story. I didn't want to have such a depressing little tale going on in here. But I was also reminded of um, uh, Rachel Dolezal from Spokane, the uh, not black black woman who uh, she was raised in a creationist household. And so a very domineering, abusive kind of family relationship that she wanted to escape from. So she invented, reinvented herself as a black woman. And here was really quite effective as the local uh, NAACP representative here in Spokane until it became clear that she was exaggerating her 
genetic identity in there. I could feel sorry for the poor lady. And, and the fact that she had a creationist background on there, I could see that, you know, they, when they were interviewing her parents and that you could realize that, yeah, that might be something where you might want to reinvent yourself, uh, given what we had had. Uh, let's see if there's anything going on over in the, um, uh, yeah, we got a bunch of side conversations going over here. Oh, old scratch says now every time I pop a pimple, I will think of volcanoes. Yeah. Well, you got a, a couple types of volcanoes. The ones that make some of the most um, uh, long term tourist attraction things are like in Hawaii, uh, shield volcanoes that spurt fairly consistently. They're not terribly tall. They'll produce long fissures and things, and they will create new real estate and make new islands and things like that. Iceland is another one. Iceland has the advantage as volcanoes go it's literally parked on the mid-atlantic ridge so it's right there on the faucet um whereas our uh, volcanoes in our neck of the woods mount shasta mount rainier uh, baker um uh, what used to be mount st helens um and the uh, mount fuji in japan um and that one in, in mexico that i can always mispronounce the name pocapacapetl or whatever that is uh, down there but then krakatoa and others um have a, a, a somewhat different shape santorini would probably have looked, uh, oh, a.k.a. Thera, a.k.a. Atlantis, um, would probably have looked um, similar to that, except it was a pure island thing. And that was another example of people that were living on what they thought was a perfectly fine volcano. I think the previous time Santorini had erupted was like 25,000 years ago. So it was prehistoric. And that's the difficulty that you have. There's references in the Pacific Northwest to the Indian tribes who were who would be telling the incoming Europeans that the mountains talk to each other once in a while, that this was they had been around here long enough that they knew that there were things going on down in those mountains, but they were not frequent enough. Uh, Crater Lake, I think it erupted like fifty thousand years ago or something like that. It's, it's a very very long time ago. So uh, if you have a long spurt. Uh, the the Yellowstone supervolcano, I think its last eruption was like 400,000 years ago. Uh, and it's, at that time, there were no human beings on and the American Year Yeah, overdue. Yeah. And in fact, typically it runs at about a four or 500,000 year volcanic cycle, which means, yeah, we may be getting to it. Plus, it looks like we might be facing a polar, a, a magnetic pole wandering and maybe geomagnetic reversal. I don't want to see that during my lifetime. <laughs> yeah, that it's going to be, be like a Cretaceous in a few decades. Yeah, we're going to have to put our little cell phones and devices in their little protective containers and then, of course, hide indoors for a short period of, or a long period of time as the magnetic field stops and all of the radiation is coming in unshielded. And oh, the auroras are going to be really pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that'll yes, be, as your you know, balls get fried off from the cosmic rays, but until then, and it'll it'll Everyone produce a burp a in uh, radiocarbon dating and all that kind of stuff. But that's uh, there's some of the tales going on in here. I have to wait for um, like yeah wait, yeah. yeah. Uh, Brian Stevens points out uh, that um, uh, Yellowstone is a semi dormant super volcano, not a shield volcano. Yeah yeah. I, I I don't want to imply that. In fact, the the Yellowstone caldera is this monstrous thing that's sixty miles across, and it would have multiple volcanoes inside of it all that when it's when it's fully active i think the description that i've heard is when if it goes full blow you'll be talking about like 10 or 15 mount st helens running simultaneously for like 10 or 15 years uh that could be um an annoyance uh but anyway the, uh, yeah um uh, and you get these um uh, w w we pay more attention to it out here given the fact that mount st helens blew up and i can remember it uh, and uh, every time when there's indication that any of the volcanoes are warming up for a while there in the 80s, uh, uh, both Rainier and Mount Baker, uh, were uh, their temperature was rising and they seem to have settled down for the time being. Uh, Rainier could make a mess even without an eruption because it only needs to warm up enough to melt the glaciers on it and you have flooding going down. Uh, some nice slushy lahars that... Mm will slide downstream because there's a whole bunch of little bedroom communities uh, around the foot of Mount, Saint, of Mount Rainier uh, that are built on the lahars of previous eruptions of Mount Rainier. So they don't quite realize what the, what's going on there going, ooh. And then of course, not just to add to the fun in the Pacific Northwest, 
uh, we've got the Cascadia Fault. And that's a subduction zone where the Pacific Plate is running down and underneath the, um, um, I, I can't remember, one of the sub things is the Juan de Fuca uh, a plate. And um, uh, that is stuck. And it's the stuck part that's a problem because it builds up pressure and then it goes, whoop. Well, whoop is what happened in Indonesia. And it produces not merely big volcanoes, but tidal waves and tsunamis. And uh, that would be sprawling all over the place. Could be quite annoying. In fact, in fact, there was an example earlier. I I think it was from that the Cascadia thing. The last time it, it went, that it sent a, a a tidal wave all the way across the Pacific, and they actually found the documentation of the tidal wave hitting Japan uh, from um, the uh, last eruption. Uh, uh, anyone can correct me on that if if I've gotten the route. But I think it was like 1500 or something like that. It was within historic times. Uh, you know, and, RJ, uh, I would love if every time. Uh, one continent slid under another. It said, whoop. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Well, that'd be fun. In, well, in a way, it does, except that it says it at very unusual frequencies. Uh, <laughs> and, of course, there's these um, uh, oh, uh, P waves versus uh, 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 S waves. I think there's uh, multiple frequencies involved that some are moving faster than the other. And so it was the interaction between these that allow you to do some kind of earthquake predictions. And then, and then also it depends on how far down it is so that, that you have things that were the difference between your, your shock wave coming out like this versus something closer to the surface where the, the, the waves are hitting the surface in different things. So it, it's an immensely complicated thing of we little creatures scrambling along on the surface of this gigantic ball where from the planet's point of view, you know, everything is just thin layer of organic on a big rock that moves. <laughs> Right now, and the um, the in longer terms, of course, it's a fascinating bit about the issue the issue of whether volcanic eruptions have interfered with human culture. Um, there was an argument for a while that the Toba eruption of I think seventy thousand years ago might have had an impact on early humans, but it sounds like they they done some study down in South Africa of the uh, archaeology there, where it looks like that at least in that little area, they just went through that with no problem. They didn't notice that anything unusual happening, but in other areas, there's a, um, a, a indication of a Icelandic volcano that went off. Uh, that um, triggered off a cascade of cold snaps and problems of crop yields and things happening all over the planet, ricocheting around and that. So, um, and then longer uh, term cycles that can occur, um, the, uh, the drought around um, uh, the time of the uh, dark ages in Greece um, that uh, made things murky. Uh, the Around 1200 AD, there was some climate shifting that's going on that that knocked off the Anasazi and quite a lot of cultures around the world. So they, they, we, we today they're actually paying so much attention to this because we are experiencing man-made climate change. So knowing how our ancestors handled previous ones and how much of it's cyclical and how much of it's triggered off because of stuff over which we have no control and how much are we exacerbating it, that's where it becomes fun. <clears throat> Uh, oh, uh, Brian uh, put up. Uh, um, uh, wasn't Brian the one that uh, uh, gave our um, geology thing a, a, a oh, run Stephen. through? Hmm? Stephen Bowman. Stephen Bowman. Yes. Uh, I, uh, my apologies. Uh, everybody that wants to uh, weigh in on these wonderful things uh, can definitely do so. The the object uh, that we're trying to do with rocks are still there. Uh, are uh, to make a, a really solid documentary work that will be very up to date, and certainly droll and funny. And you'll get just a rib tickle reading all the stupid from the creationist. And you'll go, oh, dear, I didn't I, I knew creationists could be obtuse, but this obtuse, it's almost like as we go farther and farther down, we go, oh, no, you didn't go there, did you? Oh, you <laughs> didn't swallow that. Oh, you didn't cite that paper and not notice that it actually undermines your entire argument. Oh, no. And this happens so often. It's just just amazing, uh, uh, like the Andrew Snelling citing that Lee papers. I mean, oh, you didn't check, did you? <laughs> oh no, they they definitely don't. Uh, they don't even yeah. check their own sources half the time. It seems. What what, yeah, what did you say? My humor was Victorian, isn't that? What you said? <laughs> 
Well, you're you're a droll soul. Of course, I'm Victorian then as well because I I, I stick with that style with the uh, Paralogues of Fog. So I'm I'm in that style, and also I'm a great admirer of uh, Mark Twain, who had a very dry, acerbic sense of humor where he could be sounding very polite and that. And in fact, he's giving you a backhanded uh, thing that you realize, uh oh. Oh, uh, uh, that actually reminded me of a uh, a few days ago. Someone told me I wasn't hard enough on a on a creationist and i was i thought of you <laughs> <laughs> yes yes just let rj take a tackle him there we go <laughs> you know. oh i almost uh in researching a thing on that where i found that uh, uh a nephi code relating to somebody who had latched on to the um the, the lee quote uh for a minute i thought it might have been nephilim free but he has his own separate website and it was only after i looked a bit more at it that i realized it was not Nephi code. It was Nephi code, which was a Mormon website, and hmm. uh, so it was. It's it's nice to know that that Mormons can be just as stupid as uh, conventional Christian young earth well, creationists. I mean, they are. They do propose that a group of Hebrews went to North America in 600 BC, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, or around 600. In, in fact, they, 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 if you if you've ever seen the Book of Mormon, most of the ones I, I know, all the ones I've seen actually have little chronology markers up on the chapters to where they're telling when they think this is happening. And it's like, oh, do you really want to put a date on that? <laughs> but anyway, yeah. this guy apparently is trying to argue that Lehi, who is one of their prophets, uh, didn't go to Mesoamerica at all. No, he went to South America. Never mind that we don't have the slightest indication of any of that in, in any of the archaeological record for there, let alone in Mesoamerica or North America for that matter. Uh, they just have a terrible time on this. And, I uh, that, actually, yeah, I read a paper by a Mormon one time because, uh, or Savannah and I talked to these Mormons regularly, and I, so the Smithsonian wrote a really nice article kind of shredding the whole idea mm -hmm. that there were Hebrews in North America and early, you know, around the turn of <laughs> BC to 80. But um, the, the interesting thing was one of the Mormon articles says we shouldn't actually expect to find any genetic evidence of the Hebrews interbreeding because of how small the original population was. So it would have essentially been bred out. Which, of course, was begging the question that the original doctrine didn't have Native Americans at all. <laughs> right. They were basically all uh, these uh, incoming ones. And uh, uh, the, the neat thing, although it's probably not neat from their point of view, but the neat thing is that most of the in-house Mormon technical journals where they go into their lore and the la are available online now. And uh, uh, that's not helping them any <laughs> because you can now see how they just don't come to grips. When I've talked to Mormons, uh, both current and ex, uh, on this matter, uh, it's that these subjects about the trying to connect up the, the accounts of all of these kingdoms and things with actual archaeology, that it just doesn't come up in discussions. They just don't think about it. They don't put it into pageants or anything else. Although you do see pictures, uh, I love also how the Book of Mormon typically has illustrations, and you'll have um, a, a, the Jesus. obligatory, the obligatory pictures of Machu Picchu and Chichen Itza, as though this were built by the Mormons, and then um, some typical pictures. One of my favorite ones is this picture that Jesus is visiting um, the, the, the Mormon Jews in, and they're around some temple that's obviously Mayan in construction. And they're all these big, burly football player, Nordic um, European Jews uh, that are flopped around like a, a Renaissance painting from Raphael, you know, admiring. <laughs> it, it's just, it's so iconic and kitschy and silly but they, there are people that still believe that you know and that's uh, the way it goes well we're past the uh, the hour here um let's see what we got uh, any last minute any last minute questions or comments oh lisa for truth uh, um, you're a mormon technically um do some fact checking i'm sorry <laughs> uh the um the the it's it's the Book of Mormon is completely fictional, um, as opposed to the Bible that has elements of other people's fiction that finally got percolated through. But the, the, the Book of Mormon is so relentlessly by one author uh, and uh, apparently thinking that the Book of Isaiah was um, Bibleese. But it's the glaring anachronisms. I, I can uh, not fault Joseph Smith for the mistakes. 
because if you were a, a kid from upstate New York uh, in the 1820s, uh, how would you know that that Native well, Americans developed corn, that wheat was unknown in the New World, that cattle and horses were unknown originally in the New World, were bought here from the Europeans, that wheeled vehicles were unknown. All they would have known is that people are riding around in wagons and they have corn fields and wheat fields and they've got tobacco and they have corn right. and cattle. And, and that that's the way it's always been. And how would you know? Uh, most of what we came to discover about uh, Mesoamerica uh, came about after Joseph Smith's time. Uh, they were just starting to bump into some of the Maya uh, structures in the 1830s and 40s. And uh, even at that, they were not, in some cases, not even discovering some of the stuff until uh, the 1930s and more recent times. Um, the Minoans, that's another, that's one of my other favorite cultures that nobody knew about, but that was right there in plain sight, that that was completely obliterated uh, by their downfall. And they were just mythic until, um, oh God, I can never remember his name. Uh, the um, archaeologist did some digging there on Crete and discovered them. And, and the very name for the culture is one that was just supplied to them, King Minos, uh, in the old myths. Uh, we do know that the Egyptians had a name for them. They were the Keftiu. And they, um, they apparently connect up with the Phoenicians and therefore with the, uh, Carthage. And so there's a lot of, of things. People migrate all over the place. But anyway, I digress. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it's, it's been a long time of snow shoveling and that we're going to have to look for. There's going to be a Darwin Day sp uh, speaker. Uh, in fact, I'll um, see who is scheduled. It's this Friday. And um, they always have extremely good uh, uh, speakers on, on field. Let's see. Uh, and hopefully the driveway will be cleared. I'll be able to get out there. Uh, oh, James Bull on uh, gene drives uh, that um, at EWU. And then their cake baking contest that they have every year where the science students bake up these evolution theme cakes. And everybody has that and punch and chit chats back and forth. Plus, I have a, a source I want to check up on uh, a Hamilton article that's in a, a book from the 1960s and apparently they have at the Eastern library and I'll take that as an opportunity because it's like a 20 minute drive out to Eastern, uh, by freeway. So the fewer stops, since I'm going to be out there anyway, I'll do some research there on that, uh, where um, a critic of Darwin, uh, and Darwinism and Richard Dawkins and all that he accuses Richard Dawkins of, uh, a parody of, of not, of not being original it with the, uh, selfish gene idea that Hamilton supposedly had covered this first. And uh, for that, I got to see this original paper that was in this thing and uh, find out whether or not there's any justification to it. Well, anyway, uh, that's... And, you know, Dawkins does quote, Dawkins obviously did read a lot of Hamilton because he quotes Hamilton yeah. quite a bit in, or on his like statistical work in The Selfish Gene. But I don't know if, I don't think that that, I mean, that's probably the same kind of thing that people accuse Darwin of. Yeah, uh, and exactly. I, I, I want to see in context what the original text said right. because this was the same guy uh he he's been critical of uh, darwin uh before he was arguing that darwin uh that darwin pretty much uh popularized the uh, living fossil idea and he accused him of of getting it it was not the first person to say this and um uh, he they apparently did a, a they have a data text search thing where they're going through um a, a mass of um data field that's available online now. And apparently they found a thing from the 18th century that uh, from the Royal Society that had the phrase living fossils. And um, so, ha ha, that predated Darwin. Well, it turned out to be a letter that was talking about an earlier letter from the 1690s where they were talking about someone apparently in Ireland had seen um, living fossils of a uh, living species that was uh, one that they had only known from fossil of this uh, clam or something or other and no details about what species it was or anything whatsoever on it. So it was a pretty tendentious thing to leap from that stray phrasing uh, to the idea that Darwin really wasn't the first to come up with the popular idea of living fossil. And so I decided, since he was also making the claim about Dawkins, I thought, oh, I'm going to track down this Hamilton thing too and see what that's so go on. So anyway, uh, right. oh, Lisa for Truth says coelacanths. Yeah, coelacanths, um, they're, they're, 
the intriguing example of a living fossil that's not quite as standard bit. The reason why it entered the creationist literature is because there had been some interest because the coelacanths are ripidistian fish and they're the ones, the lobe fin fish that are at that node from which tetrapods are developing. And so there was always the hope that if there were living coelacanths that they would be giving more indication of the early stages of um, tetrapod evolution. Well, it turns out they were more on a sighting. And uh, uh, so the living coelacanth looks pretty much coelacanthy, but not identical. Turns out though, because we have living coelacanths, we have their genes. And it turns out that, and their biology, and it turns out their immune system and a whole bunch of stuff about their operating things are really indicative of what early tetrapods were up to. So there's been a lot of work on that. But they're, they're, they're not, Latimeria is not the same species as the ones that existed back in the Cretaceous. Oh, no. 60 million yeah. years ago. They had, they actually have a very rich evolutionary history. Uh, they were pretty diverse. Um, they, yeah. I mean, some were even like freshwater. Uh, they also have, there are like proto coelacanths called the onychodonts way down there in like the Devonian. And yeah. they were their own little branch and then they died off. And you have this big proliferation of coelacanths throughout the Paleozoic and Mesozoic and then a whole bunch of them kind of slid off. And they've and... survived because they're very generalist. Uh, they, yeah. they live in a nice stable environment. They lead almost anything. And uh, so they, they, there's no need for them to modify. They, they're just in a perfectly happy little spot down in there. Uh, and um, the, the notion that the, the, con the, the constant evolution conveyor belt notion is largely creationist, the idea that everything has to change. So why are there still monkeys? And why are there still this? And how can anything survive? And if anything is a living fossil, it therefore refutes evolution because everything has to change. Where was that in the manual? <laughs> Certainly wasn't in right. Darwin. Uh, it, the, the main thing is that you find that that uh, forms that have remained relatively stable, uh, the tuatara is an example of that in lizards, and that they tend to be generalists. They tend to be living in a nice, stable in situation. That, that in fact, it's the far from constant conveyor beltism that evolution tends to stay the same. And so, what's interesting are the relatively rare cases of things opening up new doors and developing in novel ways. If you look at most of, this, of the therapsids the, from which the reptile mammal transition come to, most of them aren't turning into mammals. Uh, Gorgonopsids, in fact, are on a very big sighting and, and they stay in their little, little niches. So um, uh, it's a matter of trying to find out what all the data are to find out what's unusual and what's not, and then trying to find out what are the circumstances that prod a particular thing, that, that enable a particular thing to develop in a particularly unusual direction, and how long does it take to do that? So. Uh, <laughs> now we're uh, past the hour. I'm, I'm blathering on. I will say thank you very much for uh, um, uh, seeing the show today. Uh, if you haven't got Evolution Slam Dunk, um, uh, please get it because it's a splendid book. I'm very proud of it and I can use the royalties. And if you already have it, make sure you've got a review you put up on Amazon or wherever you got it and tell people about it. Um, let your libraries know about it. Let if in college environment, if they have paleontology thing, you know, say, hey, have you seen Slam Dunk? And um, any of your um, uh, anti-creationist buddies and that, you know, say, hey, this is this is a book they need to have. This is the killer app on macro, on macro evolution. You'll be able to shred creationists on it because you'll know everything they could possibly use as a counter argument, and you'll be miles ahead of them on it. And so we'll be doing the same thing with uh, the answers in Genesis in general. I, I want to have a book that Ken Ham is not going to like to see. That's the goal. Right. I agree. I think, well, because we'll be skewering him just as much as all of his cronies. So, yeah, yeah well, he's he'll... the he's the figurehead on there. And of course, what we'll what we're doing as well is we're knocking the props out from their PhDs that we're going after their technical crew. I mean, Ham is is just a blusterer. He's not a fact claimant. But the ones who are claiming to be fact claimants, your Andrew Snellings and your Jeffrey Tompkins and Elizabeth Mitchells and Georgia Purdom <laughs> uh, and all the rest are um, um, a mess of an argument. And they're superficial. Even their technical literature arguments, which they've done in Answers Research Journal and other places, are, are evasive and flap doodly. Anyway. Uh, Brian Stevens says, any book that's not the Bible qualifies RJS. Yeah, there we go. Well, any, uh, anyway, uh, everybody, I'll put the website in as a direct link here before I shut down. 
uh, because you can find links to all that stuff at, uh, at my website. And I know it is a still rudimentary thing going. And um, one of these days, I realize I've got to have like assistants and people who want to pick up the work after I'm gone because I won't be around forever. I do not want to go the way of um, some who do a massive research and they drop dead. And what happens to all that work? What happens to the stuff they haven't gotten organized yet? It needs to be available so people can make use of it. And it's not yet um, in the um, situation where I'm comfortable about the legacy. I don't. I want to have a thing where the tip project doesn't end with me. That there are people continuing the work and expanding on it and collating all that stuff, so we can build this network that will make it make life miserable for anybody that tries to argue evolution because we've got the facts and we know exactly how to get to them on a level that they can't compete with. And they're never going to be able to explain our data field. So anyway, there's my website and uh, um, check that out. Say hi and follow me on Twitter and all the rest and see you next week. Okay.